Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samson, uh, moderator. Uh, I'm very grateful for the very kind uh, introduction and very kind words. I'm told that we're joined today by the Chairman House Committee on the uh, FCT Judiciary, the Honorable Ifei Chudi Moma, uh, also uh, the Honorable Member representing JOS Southeast Federal Constituency, Honorable Dachong Bagos. The Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, uh, Alaji Abubakar Malami, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. The Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babajide Raji Fashola. Honorable Minister of State for Labor, Mr. Festus Keyamu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. I left out the Senior Advocate of Nigeria of Mr. Babaji, of Mr. Babatunde Raji Fashola, not Babajide. Uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Benin, Professor Lilian uh, Salami, the host and the president of the Law Students Association of Nigeria, Mr. Emmanuel Uwobodo, and other members of uh, Lawson present, the chairman, Roots TV, Mr. Dumebi Kachiku, uh, and of course our moderator, uh, the director of Yaga Africa, Mr. Samson Itodo. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, first let me say how uh, deeply grateful I am for the invitation to, uh, to be here with you. Uh, this is fantastic because I doubt whether it would have been possible to put together the kind of uh, really good team of uh, speakers, a good panel of speakers that will be speaking to you today, but for COVID-19. So there's some bright aspects of this COVID-19, you know, because if you had asked all of these people to travel to one point, wherever in Nigeria, they probably would have told you, well, that would be a bit tough, that would be a bit difficult. I certainly would have begged my way out of uh, attending, you know. But this is, I, I think so, COVID-19 has, uh, has some bright spots to it, has some silver lining. And I want to uh, thank you very much and to commend you for taking advantage of, of, the, of that opportunity. And also to thank all of the, the uh, very uh, distinguished uh, guests and speakers who have consented to participate uh, at this uh, webinar. So let me uh, just express my sincere thanks to the Law Students Association of Nigeria for the very kind invitation uh, to be here today and, and to speak to you on this very important subject. Uh, I was specifically asked to speak uh, within the context of this uh, summit on the topic how we can build the right mindset for a better Nigeria post-COVID-19. Uh, uh, that was the topic uh, that I was asked to speak on and I, I'll try and focus as much as possible on that. I must say that I miss the very depressing forecast pervading the airwaves. It's a, it's a major task to talk about what, what, how exactly to get to the right mindset. But one thing that is clear is that the forecasts are quite bleak. And I don't think there's any way of diminishing uh, some of the economic forecasts and some of the, even, even some of the forecasts regarding uh, what the social situation may be. I don't, I don't think there's any way of diminishing it. They're quite bleak. We are faced with a twofold uh, global crisis. First, there's a health crisis, and then there's an economic crisis. And the combined effects have resulted in possibly the greatest socioeconomic crisis in history. We're, we're, we're convinced that that is the case. In fact, there are many who will say that, that nothing like this has ever happened, uh, has ever happened to the world. The crash in global oil prices, is particularly a problem for us, that's the Nigerian uh, government, because government revenues have plummeted. Foreign exchange earnings in particular are very depressed on account of the fact that um, our major source of foreign exchange, which is oil, uh, is at the moment uh, much, uh, the prices are much lower than ever before. And uh, so we're looking at a 40% loss in revenue uh, from what we had projected, which, you know, even what we had projected was itself, you know, we're going to have some difficulty funding it. But now there's a 40% loss in revenue. 
So uh, we see uh, the uh, impending slowdown in the economy, shrimping, shrinking our GDP to anywhere between 4.4% to, that's minus 4.4% to about minus 8.91%. Those are the sorts of figures we're getting. However, I think that where the needle will ultimately fall will depend on how well we respond to the crisis, how well we can work within the current circumstances, and how to manage and adapt to the changes that we're seeing, as opposed to wallowing in worry and trepidation. Because we don't know realistically when this pandemic will end, speaking of a post-COVID Nigeria is not actually of much use. The sensible approach, in my view, is to ask ourselves where the opportunities in this global crisis lie, this current crisis. Where will the opportunities lie? I think it was uh, John F. Kennedy who said, you know, and I quote, when written in Chinese, the word uh, crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. Although I'm told that uh, that uh, linguistically may not be completely true, there's a valuable lesson here for how we must reset and what our attitude ought to be in times of crisis. The good thing about this particular crisis, and this, is, this I think is very important, is that no one has been this way before and everyone is searching for answers. So there are no experts. No, there's no, no one can say, I'm an expert in how to resolve socioeconomic crises in a pandemic. No one can say they're experts on it. And it's very obvious. All over the world, people are literally scrambling for answers. Even in the, even in the most uh, developed uh, economies of the world, they are still scrambling for answers. So, there is, so I must say to you that there is no minimum age uh, to seek the solutions to the problems of these times. And you are certainly welcome to begin to think through what the solutions will be and how we should be responding. As a government, this reality dawned on us uh, much earlier on. I'm faced with the prospect of unprecedented un unemployment figures and business closures. We had to get creative in how we thought of solutions to build resilience into our economic growth structure and to take bigger and bolder steps in our approach to creating wealth and opportunity. So <clears throat> for about two months, at the direction of Mr. President, I led an interministerial team mandated to look specifically at how to resolve some of the issues around the pandemic, its impact, and to draw up a response plan. Now, that response plan is what we've described as the Economic Sustainability Plan. And we have a committee called the Economic Sustainability Committee, which you know, uh, is obviously meant to um, implement. I, I also happen to have, to, uh, have the privilege of uh, chairing the Economic Sustainability Committee. What we tried to do in the Economic Sustainability Plan was to design strategies that would save jobs and create new opportunities. And we looked at certain broad areas. We looked at mass housing, mass agriculture, and also using, of course, in mass housing and mass agriculture, we are focused on using local resources and innovation in, 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 in agriculture as well as mass housing. Now, the whole point of mass agriculture and mass housing is that these will provide jobs. They will provide jobs for small groups of engineers, architects and all of that to build, and of course, local production of, of, of some of the raw materials would also be an advantage. So we're, we're looking at both mass agriculture and, uh, and mass housing as opportunities to create significant uh, numbers of jobs. We've also looked at technology uh, as also a, a major opportunity for providing uh, several jobs. Uh, we also consider the huge deficit in our uh, power sector at the moment, especially the deficit in availability of power to millions who have never been on the grid on the, and who have never had power. 
So we focused on renewable energy and solar power in particular, because high radiation, as you know, is a resource that we have in abundance. I mean, we have here our, all over the country, there is very reasonably high radiation. So we, we thought that that would be, that this crisis would be an opportunity to do something more significant about solar power, to provide uh, solar power through the private sector. And second, to increase local capacity to assemble, to install, and to service uh, solar equipment. So our solar home systems program, which is part of the Economic Sustainability Plan, will power up to 5 million Nigerian households who previously had no power. The systems, as I said, will be provided by local private solar companies who have also worked out digital metering and payment methods. So to give another example, you know, of what the sorts of things that uh, we're trying to encourage, Nigerian companies such as LifeBank and 54Gene have been making waves in health technology for some time now. However, it has taken a global pandemic that we're, you know, uh, such as we have now, for government to develop truly collaborative solutions, building on existing work that they've already done. So 54Gene and LifeBank, these are two private companies, are both running NCDC licensed COVID testing centers across the country now. LifeBank is also delivering emergency oxygen equipment and working with the government to create a database of available ventilators and respirators across the country. The infectious diseases centers that we have, uh, both government and private sector, have come together to build some of them, and uh, many of them, of course, will outlast the pandemic. So there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of innovative solutions that are going on at the moment. Now, this is a huge country. The, the, the thing with Nigeria, and this is something that we have to always keep in mind, this is a large, this is a 200 uh, million uh, uh, country. So sometimes things happen, things are done, and people say, I, don't even, I, I, I didn't even hear about it. I don't even know that it's happening. It's a big country. So we're always going to have a situation where there will, they, it will never seem like it's covering the entire country. I, I'll give you an example. When we decided that, look, we're going to provide um, uh, microcredit for 2 million traders across the country. In fact, we did eventually 3 million. The trader money as well as the, uh, as well as the market money schemes. 2 million traders, or, and then went up to almost 4 million. In a country of this size, many would still say, we didn't get anything. Many. So every time you think in terms of solving the problems of Nigeria, we have to think in terms of scale. Scale is it. I mean, you can do 200,000 of anything and it wouldn't make a difference in Nigeria. So scale is very important as we try to think through solutions. So as you are also thinking of innovation, you know, and innovative ways, uh, I think that one of the things that you must be thinking about is also uh, how to ensure that you are thinking on scale. You know, one of the things that we experienced in this country in the 1990s was mobile phones. At, in the 1990s, mobile phones were limited to only the affluent. I'm sure some of you guys may not even, uh, only, only those of us who are slightly uh, old, not they're not too young to run like Samson and Co. You know, but those of, <laughs> those of us who are, you know, uh, slightly elderly now, will remember that in the 1990s, phones were limited to more affluent people who could afford them. The unmet need, that existed amongst the rest of Nigerians was seen as an opportunity for entrepreneurs to introduce business models that will make owning mobile phones affordable to the average Nigerian. So today, it has not. Uh, those kinds of innovations are crucial. We must be able to innovate, and of course, e-learning isn't new. Many of us are familiar with e-learning, but the challenge of Nigeria is how do you do e-learning on scale, especially where you don't have broadband technology across the country. So there is a need to take e-learning offline. There's a need to take uh, e-learning to uh, some, so, so that it can be used on our devices without necessarily having access to, uh, uh, to broadband 
all the time, a broadband uh, technology. So the use of radios, is, some have, uh, have done very well with the use of radios, and many are using uh, all sorts of other uh, offline type devices. For those without, uh, for those without, you know, we know already that states are incorporating radio, TV lessons, some schools are even delivering work to their students uh, by WhatsApp, you know. Uh, and with regards to the accessibility of internet and technology as a whole, there are abundant opportunities, in my own opinion, for what can be done, you know. But uh, this, these are broad areas that I think we should all be thinking about. And as I said, there is no, no one is, is, uh, can say, well, I'm too young to think about this. As a matter of fact, all over the world, the solutions are being thought through and being implemented by young people. It's very difficult to find a 60-year-old man uh, like myself saying, I have now suddenly discovered, um, I'm 63, by the way, not even 60, saying that I'm now, uh, I've now suddenly discovered uh, a new uh, app that can teach, uh, can teach uh, law to law students across the country uh, possibly without the use of broadband technology. Uh, it will take uh, Emmanuel or someone to come up with that kind of uh, device, certainly not me. But perhaps of importance to us as lawyers or lawyers in the making is what these times mean and where the opportunities lie. And I think we have to think through this, especially those of us uh, who are, I mean, like yourselves, you know, uh, who are who in the next couple of years will be out there in practice, and some are already even in practice, and there are several lawyers who I'm told are listening. A few examples will tell you that we are living in the most interesting period in the history of our profession. So the Supreme Court has recently endorsed virtual court proceedings. I'm sure that many of us are aware that, you know, the Supreme Court gave a nod to, um, I, we can't say they categorically said, but at least, you know, they've endorsed virtual court proceedings, which I think is a major, it's a, a, a major revolution, you know, because it means that there will be plenty of opportunities for new technologies adapted to the dynamics of the courtroom. So we can now share documents. I mean, today we can share documents on Zoom. I can share uh, a document with you on Zoom. But for courtrooms and for, for practice, you need more nimble technology to tender documents or to cross-examine a witness from a remote location on, on a bundle of documents. So Zoom will not be the best uh, technology for, uh, for courtroom, for court proceedings, although they, they, it's been used now, but it's not the best technology because sometimes you have a bundle of documents to tender. And that may, it, it, it may be difficult. You want to show the witness, you know. So there is, there is room there for innovative technology that will be suitable for use in the courtroom. And I know that there are so many, I mean, there are, there, are, there are so many ideas that people are coming up with, but there's plenty of room for thinking that through. So we also have to think in terms of what the new rules or protocols will be. What, is, what are the new rules going to be? Courtroom, uh, by virtual, virtual court proceedings are not the same as, uh, as in-person or live court proceedings, you know, physical court proceedings. They're quite different. When you are, when you are, proceed, when, when you are, when, when you are sitting in your office conducting a case, you know, the record keeping, of course, is going to be a to totally different issue. What will the protocols be for cross-examination? What will the protocols be for making submissions? You know, how does the, how does the, uh, the questions of demeanor, you know, there are so many issues that judges look at. Say, oh, I looked at the demeanor of the, of the witness when he was being cross-examined. It's a bit more difficult to look at people's demeanor on, uh, when, when you're using uh, virtual uh, processes such as we're using today, you know, because people, people's demeanors are slightly distorted. So we need to be able to define what the new rules will be. What sort of pretrial advice will we be giving our clients now? What do you tell your client? I mean, because you, of course you know that before your client goes to court, you advise your client. Well, this is, in, in the regular courtroom, we know how to advise our clients. But what do we say to our clients today? 
when witnesses are giving evidence, another issue is, so if a witness is giving evidence from the U.S. or giving evidence from uh, Greece, which is what is possible now if we use virtual court proceedings. In the past, a witness had to be physically in Nigeria, had to get a visa and come to Nigeria and come to court. But with virtual court proceedings, a witness can sit down in Denmark and give evidence in Nigeria. So the question that will arise is, what are the jurisdictional problems? Will there, do we need to change our rules regarding jurisdiction? Can the witness, uh, can a witness truly, without being present in Nigeria, give evidence? Um, you know, how do we assess that in terms of current legislation? How about the future of the law firm itself? You know, I mean, today, everybody knows that a law firm is one of the busy places, busiest places you'll find. Lawyers, you know, all over the place, crumbling all over the place. But the workplace is changing. With COVID-19, most law firms are working off-site. Many people are working from home, right? And working from different other locations. So what will remote working mean for a law office? What sort of technology will work best? We lawyers deal with documents all the time. So you are forever, you know, drafting, redrafting, sending drafts back and forth and all that. What is the technology that will be nimble enough to handle all of that uh, traffic? And, there, you know, I think that there's plenty of room for us as, uh, to do so much around that area. What are the changes required even in the, in the employment laws and in the practice of remote work, you know? Everybody is working from uh, different locations now. So are the, um, are the employment laws fit for purpose today or do we need to change something around those? These are the kinds of thoughts and kinds of ideas uh, that we, we have to be thinking about. How about cyber security in this new world where sensitive documents will be constantly moving around the internet? How about cyber security? What happens, you know, you know how do we ensure that documents going back and forth are safe. So I want to just say as I, as I close that innovation itself is a mindset, you know, and, and, the only, and this is the only mindset that will get us out of the crisis, especially get us out of it uh, uh, in a manner that puts us ahead rather than behind. And innovators, by their very nature, uh, build much out of uh, seemingly little. And I believe that there is a big lesson here for all of us, uh, that we can make a difference, you know, ourselves. And I must say, for lawyers, and especially for the young uh, law students and some of the young lawyers who might be listening, that I believe that there is already a paradigm, sh a paradigm shift in the concept of who a lawyer is today. There's already a paradigm shift. In my own day, a lawyer was a person who understood the law, read all the laws and cited the section, section two, section four, all of those kinds of things. You know, so it was more or less a technician, a legal technician. That's how a lawyer was in those days. But today, the lawyer is a multidisciplinary, multitasking, digitally strong man or woman of affairs. I want to repeat that. Today, the lawyer, the lawyer that, must, that will, uh, fit, will be fit for purpose today, it must be multidisciplinary, it must be multitasking, he must be digitally strong, and as I said, a man or woman of affairs. By that I guess, is comfortable. Such a person is not restricted to uh, just all I can do is uh, go and argue a motion in court. No. You must be a man or woman of affairs. So how do you prepare yourself, aside from your regular law curriculum? How do you prepare yourself for this new world? I think that one must educate oneself. New ideas, you need to read widely. And there's enormous resources available online on practically any field of human endeavor. So you must be intentional about understanding technology, about understanding information systems about understanding artificial intelligence. This, is, this sort of radical uh, versatility is the new normal. You can't be uh, the guy who was, uh, uh, you can't be a lawyer such as we were or are. You're, you're, in a diff, you're a new world, you're a completely new world. 
you know. So if I come to you and I'm saying, look, today I just recorded, I, I just recorded a new song. I am talking about myself. I recorded a new song. It's a lovely gospel song, and I need advice about how I'm going to sell it. You, lawyer, ought to be able to tell me, look, there are jurisdictional issues, this and that, but I know the right place to go. I know the copyright issues that are involved in this. Understand that the days ahead are exciting. We're in the best moment in history. You have all the resources. Is and, and as I always say, never listen to these people who tell you about good old days. Never. These people probably have memory loss. And trust me, they have a memory loss. Those who talk about these good old days, good old days. There's no such thing as good old days. Today is the very best day possible. Today is the best day possible. Every generation has its own challenges. The next, the next 20 years, there will be a different set of challenges. You can't sit down today and say, oh, uh, my father told me that when he got out of school, he didn't even need to look for work. Yeah, but you need to ask him. As you would ask me, how many people were in law school at that time? There were probably only, in my set, we were, we were only 300 in the entire country. Only 300. In, I, I, I really... Uh, hope that um, this interaction will be one uh, that will give you even greater insights into the opportunities there are. I notice that there are going to be so many speakers, even from this private sector. Mr. Kachiku is a major private sector player. I'm sure that he will give us some insight into how to make money in these difficult times. And I'm sure that there will be several of us. I'm sure there will be several of us who will be telling us uh, so much. So I want to thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity and uh, to say that I wish you all very well and I hope we'll get another chance sometime soon uh, to talk again. Thank you very much. God bless you.